Hello and welcome all to our webinar today. The title of this webinar series is Doing Academia Differently in Conversation with Neuroatypicality. This new webinar series follows on from the previous 14 webinars um, that we had in a series titled Post Philosophies and the Doing of Inquiry. Um, and so we are so excited to have our second in this new series today. Um, this new webinar series is hosted by myself, Candace Kuby from the University of Missouri, Viv Boslek from the University of Western Cape, and Gert Van Hove from Ghent University. Also, Nikki Romano is with us today, and she serves in support of our webinar series and the go-to person for questions and technology help. So thanks to Nikki. So this is a free series with a total of 10 sessions. We meet monthly on the topic of doing academia differently through conversations with neuroatypicality. Each session involves one or two international guests who have had some experience with neuroatypicality in the context of higher education. This webinar series is made possible by a research collaborative partnership between the University of Missouri System in the US, the University of Ghent in Belgium, and the University of Western Cape or UWC in Cape Town, South Africa. The partnership between the University of Missouri and the University of Western Cape started in 1986. So UWC and the University of Ghent had had a partnership also for more than 20 years, and now there's a tri-continental partnership between our three universities. The funds were, uh, for this webinar series were provided to support virtual research, teaching collaborations between faculties at our three institutions. We are so grateful for our university's longtime collaboration and their support of this new webinar series. These webinars are also available on YouTube. You can find them on the website. If you would like, if you go to our website for the webinar series, you can find the way to access our YouTube channel. And then you can also subscribe to get updates when the new ones are released. Also on YouTube, you can select an option for closed captioning to see a written transcript of the webinar. We have also updated our website with the exact times for each webinar in order to take into account daylight savings times in the US because that does affect some of our time zones across the context globally. So please check the time posted next to each webinar um, on our website as the series moves forward. So Peter, if you don't mind unmuting, um, you could do a brief introduction, just introduce yourself, kind of uh, your institution, where you are in the world. Um, Viv will do a more thorough introduction of you a little bit later on, but wanted to give you a chance to say hello to everyone as we get started. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Smagorinsky. I, uh, about this time last year, I took an early, not early, I'm 69 years old. I took a retirement offer from the University of Georgia um, that they they were it was trying to they were trying to dump salaries uh, during the COVID uh, uh, budget shortages, and so a good way to cut salaries is to ask the senior people to get out and um, uh, get out of town with their with their salaries, and um, it was the right time the right offer for me and I I uh, I'm very happy to have accepted it. Um, uh, before I go any further, I would uh, really like to thank, uh, we have six attendees, um, Anani, Christy, Denise, Aaron, uh, Lenny, and Liev. I'd just like to thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm always honored when people uh, think that there's something to, to hear um, on these panels, and I appreciate your, uh, your being with us. Um, of course, I'd like to thank the, the hosts and, and my fellow panelists for uh, taking the time out this morning. This stuff is very important. Um, it gets swept under the carpet, I think, a lot. Uh, uh, and I, I, Candace, I don't know how long you want me to go on here, um, but my interest in, in neurodiversity is very personal. Um, I'm on the autism spectrum. Um, I'm, I'm highly anxious. Uh, I have obsessive compulsiveness. And I have mild Tourette's syndrome, and um, I just want to share something. I was on a I was on a panel like this last week um, uh, that originated in Brazil, and I, I read a paper. It was they had asked me to prepare and read a paper, and so uh, Tourette's syndrome. A lot of people associate it with shouting out profanity over certain triggers, and that is a type of Tourette's syndrome. Mine is more physical tics. I'm, I'm constantly tapping, 
Uh, I've learned how to keep my hands low so that when I'm tapping, I'm not, I don't want to distract other people or make people feel weird. But I, I was watching, I was watching the recording of what I had submitted and there was this clicking sound throughout the whole thing, 45 minutes, probably, I don't know, at least a thousand little clicks. That was me on my mouse. It's clicking constantly. I do it all the time. Um, I apparently even during <laughs> my presentations. So I'm, I'm just used to being a little weird, um, a little different. Uh, I, I hope I, I'm, I'm sure that some of the some of these little things annoy people, but I really have learned there's a there's a phenomenon that I that I originally heard with respect to race, which is the idea of passing. Um, the idea that a, a very light skinned person could pass as a white person and not be discriminated against and passing is something I think that a lot of people on the on these various spectra learn to do they learn to look a little look a little less like they really are in order not to alarm or or or, or make people feel uncomfortable over these oddities in our behavior so um uh, and again, I don't know how how long you want me to go on here, Candace. Um, maybe this is this for later in the session, or yeah, I think that that's a great introduction. Um, okay. and appreciate that. And Viv is going to um, introduce the other uh, hosts that you see here, and then Viv will jump in with questions for you to keep um, expanding on that, okay. if that's all right, Peter. Okay. All Got right, it. so Viv. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, and it's a lovely introduction, a very honest one to start us off and uh, sets a good tone to our, our meeting. So I'd like to introduce Nikki and it's a special day for Nikki Romano, a PhD student. She's doing a joint PhD at the University of the Western Cape where I'm also an emerita professor um, and at Utrecht University. So she's handing in her thesis today and we, we're very excited about that. She is a lecturer in art history um, at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And she's also an artist and an art educator with experience of teaching in a variety of sectors, which I think you also have, Peter. So she's been going to be providing the technical support on the webinar platform today. And she's going to also assist us in moderating the Q&A um, part of the webinar, which happens after our discussion. And, I, and Nikki's also given us her artwork as part of the series. So we're appreciative of that. Um, thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Viv. Um, I don't feel very technical at the moment. I have just finished my PhD and I cannot upload it. <laughs> I don't know how to upload it to the university websites, both of them. So <laughs> I'm gonna do my best here today. It's my lovely task is to introduce our um, three co-hosts. And I'm gonna start with Candice Kuby, who's the professor of learning, teaching and curriculum at the University of Missouri, and department chair and the director of qualitative inquiry. Candice's research interests include the coming to be of literacies when young children work with artistic and digital tools. Approaches to and pedagogies of qualitative inquiry when thinking with post-structuralism and post-human philosophies. She's also the co-author of several books, including Speculative Pedagogies of Qualitative Inquiry. And her scholarship appears in journals that include Qualitative Inquiry, the International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, the Journal of Early Childhood Literacy, and the Journal of Literacy Research. Hiert van Hover, is a professor in disability studies at Ghent University. And I'm going to introduce here differently to the way I did last time. And I'm going to say that Hirt, having now met you in Ghent, um, is a lover of jazz, of wine and basketball and his grandchildren. Viv is an emerita professor in women and gender studies at the University of the Western Cape. She's an honorary professor in the Center for Higher Education Research teaching and learning at Rhodes University. Viv holds a PhD from Utrecht University and her research interests in, and publications include the political ethics of care and social justice, 
post-humanism and feminist new materialisms, post-qualitative and participatory methodologies. Her most recent co-edited books include Post-Human and Political Care Ethics for Reconfiguring Higher Education and Higher Education Hauntologies, Living with Ghosts for Justice to Come. The, these are both 2021 publications. Back to you both. Back to Candace. <laughs> Go to Candace, sorry. Yes. We'll tag each other here. Um, <laughs> thanks, Nikki. So before we jump into our conversation with Peter, I just wanted to remind people of some of the webinar functions and uh, what's on the platform today for us to use to interact together. So this is the webinar, not a meeting platform. So the hosts have access to video and audio right now. But when we get to the question part, question and answer part of the session, uh, Nikki and I will give people the option if they would like to turn their video and or audio on um, and engage in a dialogue with Peter that way. But that's completely optional if people want to do that or not. Um, as we mentioned, we are recording the webinar for public viewing later on YouTube. Also, the chat function is open for you to connect with other attendees throughout the webinar today. So feel free to introduce yourself and say hello to each other there. Um, if you would prefer to write a question rather than, rather than ask it verbally later on, um, you can do so with the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, myself and Gert and Nikki can monitor the Q&A button and we can be sure to ask these questions to Peter if you're not comfortable um, using the audio or video function later on. So the structure of the webinar is as follows. The first 30 or 40 minutes, Viv will interview Peter on the four main questions, which is our common thread for all of the webinars in this series. And you can find those questions on the webpage for the webinar series. While discussing these, Peter will share examples from his scholarship as well as his experiences and perhaps um, some of the writing and the suggested readings that Peter gave us, and those are posted on our website as well. Finally, we will open up a space for attendees who want to be in conversation to ask questions of Peter. We hope to have at least 30 minutes for the Q&A part. So we suggest that you jot down any questions or comments that arise throughout the webinar so that you can engage in the dialogue later. So Viv, I think you're ready to do an introduction of Peter and jump into our conversation for today. Yes, thanks very much. So Peter, this is the second time I've met you. Um, I remember um, the time that I saw you at ARA, you were giving a huge public lecture, and it was actually about neuroatypicality. And I just remember um, people flocking to you afterwards and, um, you know, asking questions. Obviously, you know, this is a sort of hidden aspect of higher education that people do feel a huge need to talk about. But, you know, it's, it's gone largely unspoken. So I think you know, doing these these big lectures and that sort of thing, giving it more publicity is is very important as well as doing things like this uh, webinar series. So we're delighted to have you with us. I've been following your readings for some time. And, um, you know, the first one I read was Confessions of a Mad Professor, which really um, I, I shared with a lot of people. It, it made a lot of, um, made a big impact on me. Um, so, um, I just want to give a little bit of background about you. Um, Peter is a distinguished research professor at the University of Georgia, as he says, he's emeritus now, and a distinguished visiting scholar at the Universidad de, de Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I don't know if that's correctly pronounced, you'll have to correct my pronunciation. And um, as you've already noted, Peter, your, your interest in neurodiversity is a personal one and began with your recognition of you and your family members um, being on the autistic spectrum along with other neurotypical conditions. And uh, you've been very prolific in writing about it including um, two edited collections, and I'll just read them out. Creativity and community amongst autism spectrum youth, creating positive social updrafts through play and performance. That's a Pelgrave Macmillan, not sure which year it was produced, um, and co-edited with Joe Tobin and Kyung Lee. Dismantling the disabling environments of education, 
creating new cultures and contexts for accommodating difference. And that's by Peter Lang. Now I'm sure these are gonna be available if we ever get to go to ARA in person again. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't personally seen these books. Um, so Peter, anything you'd like to correct me about or respond to there before we get going with our questions? No, you got, uh, you even pronounced uh, pretty much everything right. And that's, that's half the battle. So um, uh, I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I always prefer short introductions. Yeah. Because if you can't follow up and prove that you're the person who was introduced, people don't believe it anyhow. So uh, <laughs> short is better. And if, I, if, if you're gonna be impressed, I'd rather have it be with, the, with what we say here than with what's on my CV. Exactly, yeah. So I, I was just rereading some of your work about neuroatypicality. And I mean, I first came across that um, word in Erin Manning's work, and I thought maybe Erin Manning had come up with this idea but but it seems like well I don't know who it was whether it was you or her or somebody else it seems like you sort of independently sort of um, decided to create this word for a particular purpose and you have a number of other words so can you talk about that well, sure. Um, so first of all, I don't want to go around claiming that these are my words or that I coined them. Um, uh, sometimes people working on very different things end up in the same place. Uh, I've got another article coming out um, on something called the projected teacher identity that my one of my graduate students and I've been talking about for several years. And we just saw someone just publish something using that very same term with a very similar definition coming up with a from a, a, a different field even. And so uh, I'm not going to, I don't really, I, if I coined a term, it's extra normative. But um, I think one thing we lack is a common vocabulary. And I, I think that uh, there are a number of terms floating around out there that, that I, I hope that we can settle on. And I've actually started getting away from the term neurodiversity. Um, because it's, it, it's come to mean mental health, broadly speaking. It, but that's not what it started out referring to. I think it, it began as a term referring primarily to autism. And I, I know that there was one panel that identified neurologically um, grounded ways of being different, autism, ADHD, uh, dyslexia, I think was one of them, and something else. So, but then other people will say depression is a matter of neurodiversity. And so I've just stopped using the word. I don't think it means anything anymore. It's just become such a broadly applied term that I don't think it has much value because um, I, I don't have experience with depression, but I know people who do. It's really different from being bipolar or being autistic. Um, I just had a conversation with someone yesterday who was actually very offended that ADHD was classified somewhere as a mental illness because she's ADHD and doesn't think she's mentally ill. Um, I've actually become very comfortable saying I'm mentally ill. I don't, uh, I don't, I have no problem with it. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that I've learned over time is that people are as much terrified by their own diagnosis and how other people think about it than they are about the way they really are. And um, so I, I think that the more we normalize the, the, the language around not being typical, the more comfortable people feel about not being typical. Um, as far as neuro atypical goes, um, there's a, there's, Neuro, the term neurotypical is, let me get my turn. Yeah, neurotypical is actually a term used by autistic people to describe non autistic people. Um, and so then I wanted, a, I wanted a way to describe the people using, the, using neurotypical. And I, I began saying neuroatypical, but the, the little A gets buried in the middle of it. And so I've started hyphenating it, um, neuro 
dash atypical, just so you can see it. Otherwise, you read right through and you think you're, you know, you think you're reading something about the opposite of what you're referring to. Um, so just, just um, it, this is another anecdotal thing. I was on a panel for an association on, we we're trying to come up with a neurodiversity, um, some kind of uh, position statement, I think, for the organization. We couldn't even agree on what it was and the committee disbanded um, because the definitions were all over the place. So I think the first thing, the first order of business is to agree on what you're talking about. And I can't speak to schizophrenia. I can't speak to, I, I know uh, bipolar people, but I don't know it well enough to really talk about it. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I think that just agreeing on what you're talking about, I'm, I've, I've just become more comfortable referring specifically to the things that I'm referring to, like autism and obsessive compulsiveness. Uh, rather than lumping it all together under this big term that describes atypicality. Mm. Yeah, I remember Erin um, Manning, you know, we interviewed her last time and her saying that it doesn't reside in an individual, but it's, um, you know, she sees neurotypicality as, as a sort of form of which can be likened to institutional racism. So, you know, mm -hmm. conditions in society which give rise to certain things, which I sort of quite liked. Right, I'll, I, I would agree with that. And I, I, I regret to say I'm not familiar with, um, that, that's a her? Yes, it's her, yeah. Uh, with, with her work or their work, I guess we should say. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. Uh, I'm, I'm not only yeah. autistic, I'm an old autistic person. <laughs> yeah. who, Anyhow, you can have I a can look blame at it her. all on something, I'm sure. You can, you can. <laughs> but um, you can have a look at her video um, at, on YouTube if you're at all interested, you know, in the previous session, uh -huh, uh -huh. because it's available. But I want to move on to, to ask you, you've said what, you know, you've really um, spoken about neurotypicality, haven't spoken so much about the other terms like extra normal right. that you've invented. But what do what does this mean in relation to higher education then? Well, uh, boy, I, everything. Um, I agreed, agreed. The, you know, if you read uh, here in the United States, there's been a tremendous amount of attention, of attention to students of all kinds experiencing mental health issues during the um, COVID lockdown. Um, I noticed that long before the COVID lockdown, uh, there were so many students who are there, the anxiety levels are up, kids are depressed. Uh, I'm thinking here more of students than faculty, but these things all exist on the faculty as well. Um, I, I don't think a lot of faculty members are comfortable talking about it. And I've been told, well, you're a tall white man, it's easier for you to do that. And I'm not gonna dispute that. I, you know, that's, that's uh, the sort of thing I hear often about my, uh, my career. Well, you're, you're, you're a tall white man, that explains a lot. But it probably does give me a certain uh, cushion for admitting things about myself that aren't that that other people would might find to be deficiencies, um, and I'm I'm also obnoxious and not obnoxious but assertive enough to be able to say, don't tell me what I'm like. Right, I I I get to decide that, and if I think I'm okay, I don't really care what you think, and because of that. I'm able to say, hey, everybody, uh, uh, I have to take drugs to get on an airplane because I want to get off the airplane if I don't. I have a terrible fear of flying. I've had panic attacks on airplanes before. That, that's a place where you can't get out. Like if I were having a panic attack now, I could mute myself and walk out of the room. You can't do that on an airplane. So I, take, uh, I have to take um, what, what they call parachute 
drugs, Xanax or Inderol for that. If I were if I, in front of a room full of people now, I would also be heavily drugged uh, with something called Inderol, which just it it lo it's a um, it lowers blood uh, adrenaline flows in your body. It makes you less susceptible to that choking feeling and the heart heavy heartbeat. I've had a panic attack giving a public talk before. Um, that's scary. I actually thought I was going to die. Um, but it was, it was a panic attack, not a heart attack. And um, I've just, what I found is the more I say that, the more relieved people are. I gave a talk at Penn State a couple of years ago on this topic. And I heard later from a guy who said, I have, I'm deeply anxious. Everyone's told me what I can't do because I'm deeply anxious. And now I've decided to apply for a, a PhD program here. Just because someone up was able to say, hey, you can do this, it takes some work, but it does being, you know, say anxious doesn't prevent you from being a good, a good citizen, employee, whatever, good, you know, good productive person. So um, yeah, I in addition to saying, I've often announced this at the beginning of talks, it's become kind of a, a boilerplate introduction of myself when I begin speaking, because it gives me a little more control over the likelihood of a panic attack. I've kind of, I've, I've, I've named it and I've put it somewhere, um, but it also makes the people out there who are scared to death of giving a talk, Oh, maybe I can do it. Maybe there's a way if I if I don't mind taking uh, these these speaking drugs, maybe I can get up there and do this too. But I also do this when I teach, and this is one of the most um, interesting things about my teaching of undergrads um, at Georgia. Uh, I taught a course; it was very kind of a diversity oriented course. So it was the whole layout of the course was trying to understand people who aren't what we think of as normal. And I open class um, by sharing that uh, the essay that Viv referred to earlier, it's called Confessions of a Mad Professor. And it was really the first thing I ever did to kind of enter that field. And I talk about being afraid of flying and talk about afraid of fears of public speaking. And the class, and I've heard they say this on their evaluations. They say after that first class, I felt much more comfortable being bipolar, or I felt much more comfortable being whatever it is they are. I've had, and this is Georgia, this is the US South. I've had a number of students come out as gay or lesbian to their classmates, um, which they would never do if kind of the floor weren't open to it's okay to be here who you are in here. And all I do is introduce myself. I don't say, and please tell me about your depression. They volunteer it. It's because it's normalized. Um, the, one of the most amazing things I've seen was when, it, when students do lead the class, is a couple students talked about their experiences with something called irritable bowel syndrome. That's normally a, a source of tremendous shame and something you have to hide. Um, and they were very open about it. And they explained to the class everything about it and how they experienced it. I, I, was, I was so floored at their honesty. And they, then they credit it back to the fact that the guy up in front started out saying, hey, sometimes this is really hard for me. Um, I got stuff I got to deal with, but I still, you know, I'm able to push through it. And one of the ways do it, of doing it is to talk about it. And uh, the number of times when people have come up to me afterwards and said, thank you for doing that, I feel a little better about myself, um, has, has made me feel, has encouraged me, encouraged me to continue operating in this way. So let me pause, Viv. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, because I mean, a lot of your other scholarship has been on totally different things. I know that, you know. Mm -hmm. You, you're a Shakespearean scholar and you've written a lot about Vygotsky. I see you now applying Vygotsky to, you know, issues of um, neurotypicality, um, which you might speak about later. Yeah. But uh, so you've spoken a bit about what it means for higher education because, and in terms of 
your own experience of being as open as possible and and that sort of giving giving possibilities for people to to actually feel okay about themselves but what would it mean for higher education to to be differently configured from the viewpoint of neuroatypicality well, there would there would have to be there would have to be a, a broader education, and I, I think that's a good question. Um, a broader education of the typical. Uh, so this is where I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, recruit Vygotsky here to help me out. Um, he he worked. It, it, it's not as well known as it ought to be, but he worked um, as he was a special ed person in the Soviet tradition, and the Soviet tradition that he inherited was actually originated in, uh, in Germany. And the term defectology was the word that they had. And so that was the word that he used, even though today it sounds awful. In fact, there's another program I'm gonna be on where a guy, uh, one of the, the hosts said, well, I mentioned defectology to one of my uh, colleagues who said, we don't do that medical model pathologizing stuff simply based on the name. Person had clearly never read any of the defectological work, but assumed that based on the name, it was all, it was the opposite of what it really is. So the, the first thing to understand is bad word, good idea. And the, the, the Gatsky's um, approach to defectology or special education, uh, particularly of the blind, deaf, and what they called cognitively impaired, uh, they didn't get into mental health. So that's been my ad adaptation to mental health. Um, but the, the, the Soviet Union was born in a time of tremendous upheaval. If you think back, 1905, there was a Russian revolution um, over the conduct of a war with Japan. So war with Japan, revolution, revolution suppressed, World War I. In the, during World War I, the Bolsheviks overthrew the Russian government, the, 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 the Romanov dynasty. And then there were about five years of civil war. So there was, there were close to two decades of almost continual war in, the, in Eastern Europe. And there were a lot of child casualties who, you know, kids who had bombs go off near them. They were blind, they were deaf. And one of the, one of the, ways that the Soviet Union tried to form itself into a new nation on wholly different principles, you know, go from a, the Tsars to the communists, that's a huge shift. They wanted to, education was one of the primary means. And so they, they instituted a mass education program that tried to take into account all these kids who had been, had bombs go off near them and who were who in the word of the day needed defectological attention. But the approach that they took was all environmental. <clears throat> it was never, well, how can we get a deaf kid to hear? How can we get a, a sighted, a, a blind person to see? It was, how do we make everybody else more sympathetic toward them? How do we get, how do we create environmental structures that enable the participation of people in, in, in productive cultural activity. And to do that, you need to educate everyone else, first of all, that being blind, the, the problem isn't being, isn't being blind. The term that, that he came up with, which I think is so insightful and so absent from today's thinking is that there's something called a secondary disability, which describes the the dysphoria that people feel about how they're treated. And this is true in a lot of ways. I actually, the term dysphoria, I borrowed from LGBTQ studies because if there's nothing wrong with being gay, but gay people feel bad about being gay because of the way they're treated. Uh, that's kind of, I think that that's a more obvious way that people can understand this. There's, you know, Vygotsky said, there's nothing wrong with being blind. Blindness is the normal condition for a blind person. But people treat them with scorn or pity or as, as different and deficient. 
that makes them feel lesser and they, they no longer can be fruitful participants in the society we're trying to build. So the, the whole approach was how can we change the environment? And that's really what I've, what I'm concerned with because I'm not a neurologist. I don't, I don't, you know, I can't, I can't do the science of, 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 of neurology, but I can understand social pressures and social interactions. That's, that's really what I focus on. And building these better environments is what's important. And I think that that class experience that I've told you about where I, um, where I share my own issues right up front, normalize them, that seems to make, that seems to change the environment because these are people who won't talk about these things anywhere else and often try to hide them. And in fact, I've had other faculty say, well, this person can't go into teaching. She has high anxiety. And then the, the student will internalize that. And I've had conversations where, where, where they'll tell me, well, so-and-so thinks I won't be a good teacher because I have these issues. And I'll say, a lot of kids have these same issues and you might be the most important person in that building for them because other people won't get it and don't wanna get it and the rules don't allow them to get it. And so don't, don't rule yourself out because you have some mental health issue. So do the kids and that you're the kind of person they need, someone who gets it. Yeah. And also in your, your writing, you've sort of gone even beyond that, not just in terms of accommodating difference, but in terms of, and I'm moving on to the, the third question about what we might learn from neuroatypicality with regards to political, ethical, ontological, and epistemological concerns. Um, for example, you know, that it can actually be a good, you know, these are, are good attributes for the sort of work that one needs to be doing in academia. Mm -hmm. And also how, how, you know, is it, what can academia learn in terms of knowledges um, about seeing differently or feeling differently? Well, um, and, and I, I hope I'm answering your question because I'm, I'm thinking of particular incidents. So there is a faculty member in my college who, I, who was in special education who teaches a course. It's, it's got the, I, I hate the name. It's sort of like abnormal psychology and everything about it is pathological the disabilities, the, uh, the disablement, the, the dysfunction, it's everything starts with a dis. And um, I, I, I can't imagine coming out of that course sensitive. I think you would come out of that course simply by the language that's used, thinking that there's something wrong with all these people and that the idea of special ed is to figure out what's wrong with you and try to fix you up as well as, as, well as you can, um, rather than saying, maybe what we need to do is educate everyone else in the building. You know, that's always missing. It's often individualized. Well, this kid needs to fix this stuff. And of course, these are the people with the fewest resources for actually doing that. The support never includes addressing the bullying that these kids experience, uh, the disrespect they get from teachers, um, though even the way IEP meetings are run, it's all about how, how screwed you up you are, kid, uh, and we're going to try to fix you, but don't get your hopes up. Um, it, those are the people who need to be fixed. And so um, if there's anything dysfunctional, it's the environment that makes these kids, and, and frankly, the adults, feel like losers. So, so what do you propose? Well, I, I think that educate an educational program would be good. I mean, that, you know, again, this is almost right out of Vygotsky. It's blindness is not a problem of the individual. Blindness is a social problem. The problem with blindness is the 
need for re-education of the sighted. And so um, there, there are people who've done, uh, it, I, my, my background is as what we call an English teacher. And in the US, that's not TESOL. That's teaching literature, composition, and language. And you know, every, I'm sure that there's a Dutch version of this and a South African version of this, where you know, kind of your national language and heritage are, are, are studied through literacy issues and especially literature. So I know some people who use uh, what we call young adult literature to and enable discussions among kids about uh, being different, about being atypical. Uh, there's a book I know called Rain, Rain uh, by Ann M. Martin that's narrated by an autistic kid. Uh, the, there's a well-known book, um, The Strange Case of the Dog in the Night, I think. Um, uh, very interesting. Again, it's the protagonist is an autistic child uh, yeah. looking for a dog. That's kind of what the book is. Autistic kid looks for dog. But you get in, kind of get insight into how the autistic kid sees the world and how the kid internalizes other people's views um, and, or has to work against other people's views all the time. So one, one way would be to use classes like the ones I taught and include texts and maybe even themes about diversity. Uh, one of the one of the problems we have in the US now is that there's such a conservative backlash against everything. Um, there are actually literally book burning uh, uh, initiatives in states like Texas because, uh, to destroy books mostly about race, you know, critical, and if they think critical race theories in there, even if they don't know what it is, we gotta burn these things. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what kind of public support there is for this sort of thing, or if you know, if you tried it, it seems that here in the U.S., you try to do something that has any empathy in it, and people think that you're a bad person and trying to ruin society by being inclusive, um, especially with race, especially with immigrants, uh, often with gender. Um, and I think that there are still stigmas attached to mental health that might. Um, uh, that, that might work against an initiative, but I, at the same time, I don't see many people trying. And, you know, the, my approach, at the, the approach at the University of Georgia is to provide counseling services to kids with mental health issues, which again, pin the problem on the kid. They do nothing to address the setting, the, the environment in which they're uh, mental health status, uh, you know, plays out. Yeah, um, it is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go, I'm conscious of the time and I want to give people a chance to interact with you, not just me. So uh -huh. I'm going to go on to the last question. Um, I don't know if, I'm sure in the States there's been a lot about decoloniality and post-coloniality debates in higher education. Mm -hmm. Certainly in South Africa, we've been extremely conscious of it. So do you see any intersection between, um, you know, issues of neuroatypicality and um, these sorts of debates and what needs to be done in higher education? Well, um, I'll, I'll relate it again to something very particular that I know. So um, when Joe Tobin and Chung Hua Lee and I were having the, this series of meetings that produced our book that I think came out in 2018, uh, Joe has, Joe studies preschools and stu has studied preschools of, the, he studied deaf preschools and that interest has led to him having a number of deaf students. And so they were at our meetings with sign interpreters. Um, uh, it was, it's a very fascinating environment to be in if you're unfamiliar with it, because uh, 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 there are certain uh, protocols that you have to be attentive to. For instance, you have, you look, you don't look at the signer, you look at the speaker, even though, so the sounds over here, the, <laughs> the sign is over here and you just, you just have to reorient who you, who, who you pay attention to. Um, 
in that setting. But um, yeah, so one of the one of the deaf guys, and he one thing to always keep in mind is that there it's almost it's unusual for anything to exist in isolation. So as I said before, I have uh, I'm, I'm on an autism spectrum, what they call high functioning. Um, the uh, obsessive compulsiveness and anxiety actually make me very, a very productive scholar because all of them are focus oriented. Um, and all I, people have told me my whole career, you just seem to have an extra gear. There's something you can, you know, we're, trying, we're going 70 and you go by us at 90. And I think that it's this confluence, this intersectionality of traits that make me mentally ill, but also make me, uh, it's a huge, I've called it the Asperger's advantage. Um, I've got, I, I can see details that other people seem to miss. And I, I don't say this in terms of bragging, bragging because I'm saying I'm mentally ill and that's why, and that helps me in my job. Uh, you know, even though I'm disabled and all these dis, dis other things. But one of the deaf guys argued very strenuously against cochlear implants as an act of colonization. You know, you're trying to colonize us by making us hearing people. And uh, I've, of course, I've never been, worn one, but apparently it's not terribly good sound. It's very echoey and it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not like, the way we're hearing each other right now. It's, it's a kind of distorted sound. But the whole idea that hearing is preferable to many deaf people is offensive and uh, a, a form of colonization. You're trying to take over our lives with your hearing stuff. And it, you know, if you're a hearing person, that's, I remember the first time I heard opposition to cochlear implants, I thought, you mean, but, then you could hear music. I mean, then you could hear birds. You know, it, to me as a hearing person, it didn't make any sense until I engaged with deaf people and and heard their the pain they feel over being considered defective and in need of normalization. Um, so uh, I, I can't even remember your question now, but the. Um, Oh, it had to do with the colonizing thing. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. I think that there's a tendency of the so-called typical to want to colonize the atypical of, in many ways. And it could be racially, it could be gendered. Um, it could be, an, it could be uh, any number of things. And uh, so I do think that there is a, the decolonial scholarship can inform an understanding of how to take the perspective of someone who's very different from yourself. And that's a, to me, that's a real key thing. Um, I, one, of the, one of the limitations of autism is you, you lack natural empathy. So I definitely lack natural empathy. I can't feel what other people feel, um, but I can, I can work at trying to take their perspective. So I have kind of artificial uh, uh, alternative ways of taking on an empathic appearance or, or, or going through an empathic process, but very deliberate one, as opposed to having the natural inborn ability to feel what other people feel. That's not available. So I think that this sort of deliberate perspective taking can help even someone like me rethink what it's like to be someone else. And I can't re-experience it, but I can listen. And listening is a big part of that. Listening to how other people describe their uh, experiences with a difference that, I, that I've never had and therefore have a difficult time understanding or feeling. And the whole, this whole, the, the, I've become very interested in emotional life and um, Western academia is built on a rationalist model that makes emotions seem uh, uh, frivolous. And I would argue that emotions are foundational and that rationality is often an illusion. Uh, I, I, I borrow from a guy named Jonathan Haidt on this point. Uh, he refers to the rationalist delusion of Western, of Western thought because it's, it's muffled the role of emotions, at least in, in the 
philosophical conception, even while they're still constantly at work. And that's all that you could also take that to be a gendered thing where the males who run academia or who have historically run academia think that that's women's stuff. Yeah. You've said so many interesting things. And um, I'm, I'm wanting to open it up now because we've got about 30 minutes left. Okay. If we take, if we shave off about four at the end for sort of talking about the next, our next um, part of the series. So I'm going to ask Nikki and Candice and Geert to, to look at um, who might be wanting to engage with Peter. Yeah, thanks, Viv. So I think Nikki is um, giving people the option if they want to join in with their video and or audio. Um, people, you don't, you don't have to accept that invitation. If you would prefer not to, you're welcome to stay without video and audio. It looks um, as though so they all took the invitation. I know, I think they have. I, know I started to see all the boxes pop up on the screen, but yep. Peter, thank you for sharing your experiences. It was really, like Viv said, a lot for us to think about. I'm sure we'll have a good number of questions. Um, so I would suggest that if people do just want to type a question in the Q&A box, myself and Nikki, we're happy to read those aloud and make sure they get into the conversation today. But if you're choosing to have the video and audio, then I would um, encourage you to use the, the little reaction button that allows you to raise your hand. Um, and that way we can call on people um, and just be notified that you do have a question that you would like to ask. Um, so we'll give people a little bit of time here. Um, we can check the Q&A box to see if we have anything there. If not, if somebody has a question and wants to put their hand up, feel free to go ahead and we'll um, engage Peter in some dialogue with, with us all. And just to understand, I'm looking at the chat box. I'm, I'm limited to English. Um, there's a, a, a while, while we're waiting, I'll tell, a, I'll tell one of my linguistic jokes, which is um, it, you, you, may, you may know that the word trilingual refers to people who speak three languages and bilingual refers to people who speak two languages monolingual refers to americans we only got one language <laughs> i see that gear's hand is up do you want to start okay, us off and then maybe denise can follow up with our second question so peter thank you for your answers on the questions and I keep on watching and being jealous about your shirt at the same time. Um, I would like to confront you with something that happens at the moment in our university in Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, last month, our university decided to become a more inclusive university, not only for students, but also for staff. And they will start with a special network for staff with so-called abnormalities, disabilities, whatever words you would um, give it. And uh, one of the reasons why they start this network is because uh, there are a lot of complaints about staff who are, for instance, very good researchers, but not that good communicators in coaching teams or in taking leading positions. Mm -hmm. So our rectorate is very nervous about it and they hope to solve the problem by installing such a network of staff members who are outing themselves uh, as being someone with a special characteristic or whatever you call it. Uh -huh. how, 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 what do you think about this action? Well, I, I, I'd have to see what it looks like in actual practice. I, I would not want to force people to go public um, with, because some people still are, are reluctant to, um, to take that role. Uh, and, and you know, there, there are so many built-in issues of shame and, and embarrassment and feelings of inferiority that come with uh, acknowledging having what a lot of people consider to be a disability. So I, I would be very careful about how, how those confessions, if you will, 
are um, are solicited. Uh, I I I do think that it's that it's laudable that they're trying something. So that you know, I think that there is a, there's praise to be uh, distributed just for making or recognizing there's a problem and trying to do something about it. Um, I would say my own experiences as a um, as an advocate through my own um, revelation of 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 how I'm how I'm made up has been good for me in a very local way, and I know I've. I've talked to various students who aren't my students who who hear that I can that I'll listen to them. So I, I think it depends on what they do with it um, and and how they go about it. Uh, you know what what's going to happen? Like well, let's just say here with our panel, let's say Candace says I'm bipolar and Viv says and I'm schizophrenic and and Kirk says I'm depressed or something like that. Does I don't know if that's enough. I think it needs to be developed into a uh, something informational and educational, and that it's not just a bunch of facts, but but understanding the the feelings because it's these feelings of shame, it's these feelings that you're you're that you're carrying a stigmatized way of being that I think make it difficult for people. So I, I think the goal would need to be to comfort and reassure people that what what makes them different doesn't make them worse. Does that make sense, here? Thanks. I will take the message. Okay. And you know, if I, if 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 that doesn't make sense, or if you want me, if you want to push on it, go ahead. Uh, I've never seen a program like that, so I don't, you know, I don't say, oh, you should see how they're doing it at mm -hmm. bits or something like that. Um, okay. I, I, I just don't I just don't know, but um, I, I hope that's at least a, a start. And I think that kind of anything we do here is all is kind of provisional and a start, not the answer. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see Denise's hand us up. Yes. That yes. Um, hello, Hi. hello, Peter, and hello, everybody. Peter, thank you so much for your presentation. And I want to say that I really enjoyed the reading so much. Oh, good. And thanks. I learned a lot from them, both the one about Vygotsky's defectology and your autoethnographic confessions of a mad professor. As I was reading the latter one, it made me think um, of a PhD student of mine who has really been struggling for a number of years. And up until now, I had ascribed that to a kind of conceptual or analytical inability or weakness or lack of direction. Mm -hmm. But on reading your paper, I thought to myself, I wonder if at the basis of that, there could not be some kind of neuroatypicality, whether it's something to do with anxiety or something else. Um, I don't know what. And so this, of course, could be the case or not necessarily so. My question to you then is, as, as a supervisor, um, I think you call it advisor yeah. of, of a graduate student, what does one do in such a case? Um, how does one go about trying to talk to such a student to perhaps uncover if there isn't something else besides what I had previously thought? Well, that's a great question. And I, I hope I can just uh, give an illustration. Um, actually, I've had a number of um, graduate students with a, a, a couple of bipolar. Uh, one ended up doing her dissertation on, uh, she, she, she came in wanting to do a kind of standard writing assessment study, but, uh, the more I talked to her, the more I realized that her kind of greatest interest was kind of getting to the bottom of her own bipolar condition and understanding other people. And she actually studied my daughter, among other kids, in a study of uh, young women with depressive uh, conditions. So I, I think 
I think one thing to do always is to listen. I can't emphasize too much the importance of just listening to people. Uh, and, and if I hadn't listened to her, she wouldn't have done that dissertation. She would have done it on a on kind of a standard topic. Um, I had another student who was clearly, there was, there was something missing, I guess I would say. He, he couldn't remember anything. Um, you, you know, you'd give him directions on something and then he would do the opposite. But he was not dumb, you know, he was a smart guy, but there was something wasn't working. And I learned that he'd been in a car accident as a teenager, he'd been in a coma. Um, uh, actually, his father had left the family while he was in a coma. And um, so he felt abandoned. And when he came out of it, there were definitely some things weren't clicking the way they used to. And, but I didn't, it took me like a couple of years before actually his mother told me some of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I went a couple of years just thinking, what the, what's wrong? What's, what, what isn't working here? It, he, there's just something that's not working. And so once I learned the nature of what ailed him, I, I said, if I'm gonna keep advising you, there are a couple of things you have to do. You have to go up to learning disabilities. We have an office on campus and get support. Um, both for, uh, for instance, he, he wouldn't take notes at meetings because he thought it made him look dumb and then he'd forget everything. And so part of the support was learning. Sometimes you just have to turn your phone on and record the thing. Um, and admit that you you have this problem with remembering everything. Um, so there were there were some there were some ways that he could address his own issue by getting better tools to support himself. The other thing I don't think he understood was that he was highly anxious and he would panic. And I said you need to get support for your anxiety. I said I can't advise you if you're if you're not gonna help yourself get through this. And he actually did, he went up and he completed his degree. Um, and the other part was he needed an environment that, that respected him and didn't, didn't pathologize him when he, was, when he did things wrong. It was, how can we help support you get through this, um, this doctoral degree and then a career that's gonna make the exact same demands on you? So it was a combination of, uh, and this, this is also very Vygotsky, and by the way, Vygotsky never denied that these things are there. He, he had a very serious interest in neurology, but the, his emphasis was always on the environment. The, you know, the, how, the, the, how can we change other people? I can't, say, I can't emphasize that too much. How do we change everybody else? Not how do we fix the, the person who's different? Um, and I, I realize I'm also saying he needed support, but that that I think is part of a supportive environment is to is to give is to lead the person toward means of support that are going to help them get through this. So um, Denise, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I would I would say that at least when I came across this with my own in my own advisement of my own doctoral student. The most important thing I did was listen to the people who could help inform me and then try to work with the student in the, in the context of what uh, some, some serious cognitive issues he had that, that were the result of a head trauma. You can't pretend that's not there, um, but you can act differently around it. And Peter, thank you very much. You've, you've been very helpful around giving support and listening. But my problem is sort of with identifying the problem, if there is one, mm -hmm. and helping the person to identify the problem, if there is one. You know, how, how do you do that? If the person is quite well guarded? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. And Denise, are you are you in South Africa? Yes. Okay. I so I, I've I've only I've only spent three weeks there. I'm I'm a I'm a 
I'm a tourist at best. And I don't know, I really don't know the mental health situation there. Um, I would, I know that it's becoming more, it's becoming increasingly uh, acceptable to admit that here, even though we're not, we got a long ways to go just because it's in the news all the time, all the, all the people seeking mental health support and the, which has exposed the inadequacy of the services we have here. Again, though, those are all directed to the individual, fixing the individual. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that there is a role for that. There is a role for counseling. There is a role for medication. There is a role for these cognitive supports. Um, I wouldn't rule out anything if it, if it helps. Um, but it, it sounds, Denise, what I'd say is you're, you're on the road um, because you, you, you're not just saying this kid's a loser or this kid's dumb or this kid's whatever. You're saying, I think there might be underlying issues. I wonder what they are and how we can um, work toward finding uh, a, a resolution that helps the student function in this setting, which is the setting you find them in. Uh, again, I don't, I, I can't, I can't solve a problem of a person I don't know in, in this medium, but I, what I would say is that you're on the right track and that, and the, the, the destination is not, you know, it's not the Wizard of Oz. You're not going down a, a single pathway. You're, it's a very open, it's a very open-ended problem that you're getting into, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's something you're interested in working at. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm wondering whether to um, send this person a copy of your writing. <laughs> I actually, that's that's been done, and I, I I'm, that's a, it's honor it honors me to think that that would be that would help. But what I have found is that people who see someone else admitting it kind of go, maybe I can do this after all. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I, I noticed that originally when I um, would just talk about because I had these I had very public meltdown. Uh, gave it, I was in the I was a minute or two into a conference talk and I fell apart. I had to leave the room in my in my own talk. Um, so you know I I uh, what I found in talking about that with other people they'd say oh boy I have trouble with that too. That's kind of. Whew. I'm glad to hear. I'm sorry. I'm glad to hear you do too, because that doesn't make me so weird. And uh, I think the shared acknowledgement can go a long way in starting a process of um, of taking the right steps. So I I take medication every day. You know, I'm not going to pretend I'm just doing this uh, through sheer acts of will. I I take something called Paxil, which really just takes the intensity down uh, 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 a few levels. And then I take additional drugs for speaking. So, you know, maybe medication is what this person needs. I don't, I don't know, because I, you know, it's not a case I can see and I'm not a doctor. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Nikki, I think you're muted, Nikki, but Nikki was going to ask one of the questions from our Q&A box. So try to okay. unmute first. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just saying we've got four questions in the Q&A box. Uh, would you like them one at a time? Yeah, again, one again, I've got the uh, I've got the gallery. You can see them there. there? No, I can't see the chat. I can put okay. the chat box up, but I, I want to no. see the people. All right. So the first one says, can you speak about coming out as autistic? How this affected colleague, colleagues in academia? Um, with students, et cetera, what were your challenges? Um, this, well, I, I'll tell you how it originated. Um, so first of all, I had no idea of any of these things until I had a meltdown um, at the same time my daughter was having meltdowns. And the people of my generation typically learn of, of their place on the spectrum when their kids get diagnosed. And you're sitting at the meeting with the therapist and you're going, are you talking about her? Or are you talking about me? It just sounds like you're talking about me here. And that's when you go, oh, right. There's this genetic dimension to all this. And I went, 
oh, that's right, we're both just like my dad. You know, so I think that there's a, um, these acknowledgements can be, uh, can take time. I had, a, I had a buddy whose son came home from college his freshman year uh, after having had a bipolar meltdown. And when they, when they talked to him, they, uh, when he was going through the therapy sessions with, um, with some, I don't know, some professional, they said, well, is there a history of this in your family? He said, no, he said, no nothing like this has ever happened. And then later he thought, oh, wait a minute, my uncle committed suicide. And he sudden, suddenly he expanded his understanding and was able to link it to other things a lot better. So that family histories can be, um, can be very illuminating. Um, but I, I, I wrote, uh, I review a lot of articles for journals and I, uh, actually a fellow in the, uh, in Australia, Alan Luke asked me to review an article for one of the journals he edited. And the person used a lot of pathologizing language about, uh, I can't remember what it was about, but pathologizing language when it came to mental health issues. And I said, if I can do, accomplish anything in this review, it would be to just let the author know of how offensive that language is to someone like me who's on the spectrum and blah, blah, blah. And often, you know, you send this review and you never hear anything back or, you, you know, it kind of goes into the void. And Alan wrote me back up within a week and he said, hey, man, you got to write about this. I said, you can't let this go. He said, this is, this is big. And, I, and I'd never thought about writing anything like this before. And I hadn't done much autobi autobiographical writing. And so I thought, well, let me let me see what this looks like. And I wrote it. Uh, and in about a week, I had the basis for the article on is the confessions of a mad professor. And <clears throat> one, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting about the review process of that one, because I sent it into Teachers College Record and they got two reviews. One said, this is fantastic, print it as it is. And the other one said, well, this is interesting, but it's not research. This is a research journal. This is a story. You can't. How's this research? And so I got it back and I worked on it. And fortunately, my editor, Lynn Corno, was very, I think she liked the essay, but was trying to find a way to justify it and um, justify it as research. And so when I resubmitted it, I called it autoethnography. And that magically turned it into research. So that's, that's part of what you got to do. You got to get the right word in there. You got to get, you call it the right thing. And uh, that, that helps. So now, then it became an autoethnography instead of just a kind of memoir or reflection or something like that. Um, so uh, I, I, there was a, I was telling that story for some reason. Um, Nikki, what, what was the, what prompted that? It was um, how, it was your decision to claim autism as mm -hmm. a mental, oh no, sorry, it's, uh, um, let me go back. It's, I'm reading another one now. It was asking what your challenges were to colleagues and students and oh, coming okay. out as someone so, with autism. I had been encouraged. You know, that, that helped. I'd been encouraged. And I'd, and I'd already talked about it informally in conference hall quarters with my students and that sort of thing. And uh, I mean, I had to, after this meltdown, I had to miss a month of classes. Um, and so my students knew that something weird had happened or something unusual had happened for me to miss the last month of the semester. Um, and so it was, it was kind of out. And I got some very interesting, um, one, of the, one of our department uh, office managers and people used to call receptionists or secretaries gave me an article on how to have more confidence as a speaker. And so, you know, people were give, trying to get very sincere things that were very off. Uh, you know, you get all sorts of advice. Well, you, you, this guy lacks confidence. Well, if you know me, you know I don't lack confidence. Um, but and and that's why falling apart while giving a talk was so traumatic for me. So wait a minute, I'm this isn't supposed to be me. You're not supposed to fall apart like this, but I did. Uh, and and so um, if I if I could just go back to this idea that it's so important for people to understand what all this stuff is, and uh, unfortunately in higher education, there are often people who want you to fail and will use you know your 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 colleagues who see themselves as your rivals 
want you to have problems. And I would say that I ran into just as many people who took advantage of it as a way to uh, undermine my status uh, as there were people who thought, hmm, this is interesting. And uh, there were also people like I, I, we were talking about a multicultural environment. And I said, well, what about, what about creating, what about mental health? And uh, actually a, a lesbian in my department said, well, how's that multicultural? You know, a, a person for whom multiculturalism is designed to work on behalf of. And I said, well, you have to change your, how you act around atypical people. That's a cultural issue. How you act around people as part of the culture. How, how could it not be? Um, and I think that there's a little greater. So I started advocating in my department for when we talked about inclusion, that we were including more than just people of different races and different genders uh, and, and, and social class issues. Those are kind of the big three of inclusion. Uh, and started thinking more broadly about the number of people with mental health issues, of whom there are many. It's just that you can't see them because people are hiding them all the time or, or, or have been bullied into not wanting to admit them. So, Peter, we have three other questions. I'm going to try to see if we can get to them before we okay, end I'll, today. So our, our, next, too much. <laughs> our next one is, um, I'm curious about your decision to claim autism as a mental illness rather than a different genre of human being. Would you mind speaking to this idea a bit? Uh, well, um, that, that's a good question, and I, I would, um, I think I was using the language available at the time I wrote the, you know, the different papers as they've been coming out over the last decade, I guess. Uh, and the, the terms, especially at the beginning, the Mad Professor article, I was just trying to wade into these, these discussions. And um, so I, I, I think I, I I don't I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I guess that makes it a, a pretty good question. And because I'm still trying to get to the bottom of what I call things. And as I said, I've I've abandoned neurodiversity entirely uh, because it doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, mental health is a is a dicey term because it's associated with madness and lunacy and um, uh, uh, lack of functionality. So I, I, and as I said before, I talked with someone yesterday who was deeply offended at ADHD being called a mental illness. Um, and, and, and neurodiversity has come to stand for all these things. So I wish, I, I think I said earlier, one thing we need to do better as a profession is agree on what's what and what to call it. Uh, because otherwise, you know, you'll have neurodiversity meaning everything uh, and, and therefore meaning nothing. And, um, you know, mental, I've, 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 I've struggled with the whole idea of what mental health and mental illness are. And I, I can't say I've ever really arrived at a satisfactory set of terms. So I, I encourage, uh, I, don't, I don't know who this, the questioner was, but I encourage you to help us arrive at a better way to talk about these things. Thanks. Um, the next question is as follows. I will be teaching an undergraduate course called Typical Atypical Development for future general and special, special education teachers. It is online and the text includes an inclusive education slant, but I want to bolster the coursework by modeling inclusivity. I have some ideas, but would love to hear some of your recommendations. Um, so if the idea is to model inclusivity, um, you know, I, I had the, and when I taught, I had the kind of convenience of offering myself as an example. Um, not everyone can do that. And uh, I, I, would be, I would be cautious about coming across as colonizing and patronizing in like, I'm, I'm typical, how do, how do I include? And 
you know, I, I think of the word tolerate, how do I tolerate you, you different people? Uh, I think that there's a, there's quite a, uh, that's a perilous and, and tricky line to walk um, between being that colonist and being a genuine, genuinely supportive, empathic uh, uh, co-traveler. And I, I think that that is, that's the, that stance is, uh, it worked for me. Um, again, I don't, I don't know the speak, I don't know the question or, or what your own uh, profile is. Um, but if, if there are ways to enable the class to listen to speakers who speak on behalf of, of, the, of the condition that they represent, in, in such a way that people are that people listen, I think that that would be a start. And I I don't know I don't I, I don't actually don't know the location of the speaker either. I don't know what how that is supported contextually. Like institutions have to support these things too. Um, it, it's hard to do it if you're the only one in the only one there doing it. But um, yeah, I. I, I would probably need to know more about your situation to really give good advice other than to try to get first person accounts, whether you provide them. Um, I, 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 you might guess I'd be reluctant to say, okay, all the bi bipolar people raise your hands and tell us what it's like. I don't, that's not gonna work. Uh, so, so the question I has put in the chat that uh, I'll read it, I do identify with various marginalized groups and we'll begin there with sharing of myself. Well, that's, that's sure a start. And I, I think the you know, marginalization is a feeling as much as anything else. You, um, it, it's whether you feel marginalized that matters. And so talking about the feeling of marginalization, I think is very important. Um, but I, I, I also think that it's important to not just emphasize the negatives, but to, but to assert the assets. And that's one of the things I've always tried to do. That's why I talk about the Asperger's advantage. I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be on this panel if I weren't, if I didn't have that set of intersecting, you know, mental illnesses, uh, because they, they give me that extra gear. Um, there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting um, test. Ah, I forget the name of it, but you'll see like a big H. And, but the H, and this is uh, done with a typewriter or something like that, a word processor, but the H is made up of little A's say. And if you, if you put that on a screen, you say, what do you see? Most people say, oh, that's an H. I, all I see is the T's, all I see is these little things, right? I don't, and like, oh, I guess that's an H too. But what I see is a million little A's. And that's, to me, that's an asset. That's, even though it's atypical. And so your atypicality often provides you with a perspective that's, that's insightful or, or at least different. Um, and to me, the whole benefit of diversity is not to have different colored people in the room, but it's to have different points of view in the room, different life experiences in the room that enable the rest of us to question our own normality. Uh, to me, that's why diversity matters, not just to have different uh, appearances. So Peter, I we have one last question. I know we started a few <laughs> minutes late. So if if you're okay, I'll ask this final question. Maybe you can comment on it briefly. And then I think Viv and Gert are going to wrap us up and uh, announce our next webinar and things like that before we sign off for the day. Um, so the final question we have is, um, in your notion of changing the environment, are you also ever thinking about the goals and expectations and ways of demonstrating learning and knowledge or what it means to know or what kinds of knowing matter? Um, I, I, if I understand the question right, I think it would require very different notions of knowing. Um, <clears throat> because school is often about what information you know and can repeat. Um, it's often how logically you construct an argument. 
but what all these things have a deep emotional basis, I think. And so being able to feel how other people experience the world is critically important. And um, if everyone experienced it the same, we wouldn't need to include outsiders or marginalized people. Everyone would already be there. So I think that being aware of the emotional impact of being treated as inferior because of an atypical makeup is critically important to helping to build the environments that, um, that are more supportive and more inclusive. Um, and ultimately, I guess the goal would be not to need a word like inclusion because you wouldn't have people marginalized by the by attitudes you know it's not your blindness that or your <clears throat> or your depression that marginalizes you it's how you feel about being that way usually by the way you're treated and you know thank you Vygotsky for 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 detailing this idea of a secondary disability it's really helped me think about a lot of things beyond what beyond special education uh, about but about um, dealing with human beings that that is critically important I think um, we will have to sort of bring it the the session to an end um, I wanted to thank you so much Peter for putting yourself out there <clears throat> And, you know, for doing it for many other people, too. I think it's hugely important. Um, and hopefully, you know, it will give others um, the courage also to, to own their own experiences and how they can actually be helpful, as you've said, for doing what they're doing. And I think you would really like the work of Erin Manning. Yeah. And, and how she's um, worked together with autistic people. So I would encourage you also to, to have a look at that, um, that YouTube and maybe to pursue it, just uh -huh. a, a thought. But I'm going to hand over to Kiet now just to, to sum up and then maybe to tell what's happening next time. Thank you, Viv. Uh, also from my side, Peter, thank you for bringing us what I would call uh, a kind of balanced choreography, starting with a lot of personal elements and then going to Vygotsky and coming back to your own personal um, story and uh, experiences. So I think it's, uh, I, I think I understand better now why, why you are a Johnny Clegg fan. Um, I think also Johnny Clegg was a very complex person being a musician, but also if I'm right, uh, an anthropologist who was trying to, to help people to bridge between music styles and to make sure the personal and the cultural was, 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 was brought together. So I, I think I, I, I understand a little bit uh, about your fascination um, connected to, uh, to Johnny Clegg. I also want to thank the audience of today for being there and for asking questions. Um, it was a little group, but I think it was a good group. Uh, little groups are always the best groups. Uh, so this Thursday group was a very good group. And for next month, uh, we prepared a new session uh, on December the 16th, close to, uh, to Christmas. Um, and there we will meet uh, Dr. Leni van Goetzenhoven and Professor Elisabeth Schauer, they are both in the audience today. And I think they are preparing very thoroughly uh, a kind of uh, introduction for us next month. And I can, I can tell you that um, they are both wizards in combining um, a very warm um, um, passion for humans uh, with a post-human uh, philosophical uh, way of working and thinking. I think both of them are very talented. Uh, um, uh, Leni started like uh, Peter today from uh, uh, literature studies and cultural studies and 
Elizabeth once was trained in an almost defectologist environment uh, in a faculty of psychology and educational sciences and um, escaped from that uh, environment uh, staying but but stayed at that place um, making use of disability studies and post-human philosophy so for all of you who are here today we hope to uh, meet each other again next month and if you have friends or family that are interested in these kind of uh, sessions, um, spread the word and bring your friends and colleagues with you for next session. And um, I hope between now and then um, you can stay safe because here in Belgium, we have the fourth wave of COVID. I don't know what wave you are working and fighting uh, against. So please stay safe and take care for each other. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, so much. And, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers and uh, and and the folks who dropped in. And um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to to visit with everyone today. Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye bye. Okay, thank bye. you.